are listening to Neurosalience, the OHBM podcast. Welcome to the Organization for Human Brain Mapping Neurosalience podcast. I'm your host, Peter Banatini. Here, I interview neuroscientists and discuss their work as well as the latest developments, issues, and controversies in the field of brain mapping. Today, I'm talking with Dr. Jack Gallant, a neuroscientist and engineer at heart who trained with David Van Essen at Wash U and then went on to Berkeley. He currently is a Chancellor's Professor of Psychology and Class of 1940 Endowed Chair at UC Berkeley and is affiliated with the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. His work spans from single unit recordings to whole brain fMRI, embracing the whole of computational neuroscience, setting an extremely high standard in technical rigor, creativity, and insight. fMRI is ultimately about separating a known but variable signal from highly variable noise. How one does this makes all the difference. And fMRI is particularly challenging since what is signal and what is noise is not always clear as they both vary in time and space. He's a huge proponent of fMRI encoding and more generally careful model building to probe the time series and thinks that more model-free approaches or paradigm-free methods are ultimately limited. The discussion gets tactical as well as intense at times. The points he makes are all important. While we agreed most of the time, there were some nuanced differences of opinion, mostly when it came to discussing alternative methods for probing fMRI data. Overall, it was an incredibly fun and hopefully useful discussion. What does come through in this podcast is his passion for what he does. And given that we only barely got into my questions, we'll be having follow-up conversations with them. So enjoy. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jack Allen, for uh, being on this podcast. And um, you know, today we'll just kind of jump right, start right into the questions. I, uh, you know, you've done, clearly, you've been sort of a force in neuroscience ever since uh, you got started. And, um, and you've been moving into fMRI and uh, actually doing some inspired work as far as from the, from the modeling end, from the processing end, kind of linking, uh, bridging the gaps to uh, single unit recordings, uh, and and actually um, having some really you know you have a you're you're sort of pioneering sort of this rich area uh, of you know naturalistic stimuli combined with uh, encoding models and finding some results that are that are impactful and and kind of cause people to sort of shift their perspectives on what's possible with fMRI. So let me just. Um, let me just get started with uh, the, the first questions. Uh, you know, people who have heard you talk uh, know that you're you know, you're very passionate about uh, and have very very clear ideas as to uh, the right way to do things and um, uh, and how to actually do good science in general. So so what? How did that start? I mean, maybe to the extent that, that it's relevant to to what you what you're doing now. Um, you know, what initially motivated you? You know, what what uh, did you have any sort of formative experiences? Were there any mentors that sort of really opened your eyes? Uh, how did that go? Well, um, I have a kind of a motley history in, in neuroscience. I was originally a computer science major. And uh, I was, by the time I was a computer science major in college, I'd already been programming quite a while and I was just burnt out. And I took a psychology class and it seemed really cool. And so I switched into psychology got my BA doing psychology. I went to graduate school in psychology. And uh, the problem was for, for me personally, you know, I have this philosophy that everybody has their own sort of specific gravity of ambiguity that they can deal with. And, you know, life is brownie in motion. So you're just some particle being bounced against other particles through history. And uh, you don't, you're, you're going to get inserted into this specific gravity, you know, sorting column kind of at a random level and you have to float up and down to find your own level of ambiguity that you're comfortable with. And what I found in graduate school was I was really as an undergraduate and then in graduate school was I was not comfortable with the ambiguity in psychology because I felt like I was recording from neurons that were attached to the finger when what I really cared about was neurons attached to the brain. Behavior is a, I think doing behavior is a very hard way to make a living because there are many, many sort of behavioral metamers, the same behavior that arises due to very, very different brain states. And there's no way to take them apart because behavior is just a very low dimensional 
measurement, especially if you're in a reduced paradigm, like a visual search paradigm or something like that, it's not naturalistic. The degrees of freedom are so low that there are thousands of different brain states that can give rise to the same behavior. And it seemed to me that you're never going to solve the problem that way. So in graduate school, I basically reverted to the roots of psychology, which is visual psychophysics. That's psychology all started, you know, with uh, British philosophy and German psychophysics with Hermann von Helmholtz. And I, I was reduced to basically doing pretty low level psychophysical experiments. And then I became frustrated because I realized that, you know, that was still not low enough. So in my postdoc work, I switched into neurophysiology and I did neurophysiology with David Van Essen. And then I uh, had a neurophysiology lab at Berkeley for many years. And then I I, this was all before 1995, right? So it was before fMRI existed, <laughs> which for the <laughs> young listeners of this podcast may seem like a weird time, like it never existed. But no, for most of neuroscience, <laughs> fMRI did not exist. There was no easy way to uh, study humans. Um, you could, if you were interested in uh, the human brain, you could study brain lesion patients, and, and that was about it. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, fMRI was a miracle. You know, it was like the aliens just kind of flew over the university and like dropped these weird boxes onto the campus that here you go. All of a sudden you can study the brain. And it was, you know, fascinating, especially at the early days of MRI, as you well know, because you were involved in that. Um, it was like the universe had no boundaries yeah. and people could explore questions they never could before. And I was very excited about that. Berkeley got its first MRI machine in um, around 2000, 2002, something like that. And my lab immediately started working on MRI and we did it from, a, I, th I think what made my lab, what makes my lab different than other labs. And uh, even at that time was we did not approach fMRI from the standard point of view that most people do. So al almost the entire MRI community uh, at that time and still today, either comes from the point of view of sort of clinical neurology or psychology, where uh, essentially the studies are all group-based studies. And you, uh, the group-based study model from psychology sort of has crowded out the classic psychophysics model of psychology. It's two very, very different philosophies, how you do things. Yeah. In psychophysics, you know, and the way Hermann von Helmholtz taught us 150 years ago was you get a subject, you record thousands and thousands of trials from that subject. You build a model of that subject really, really, that's really incredibly accurate. And then to make sure that it's not something weird about your subject, you get a second subject yeah. and you do the same thing. And that's the same philosophy that comes in neurophysiology. Most neurophysiology experiments are designed that way. Yeah. Yeah. Psychology experiments are designed under a very different philosophy because in psychology, you assume that you're studying essentially slightly coercively um, motivated undergraduates who are a very diverse collection of people yeah. who uh, you're not going to get much data from each individual person. And the individual variability is going to be very, very high. And therefore, studying individuals is kind of pointless. You just study the group. So everything in psychology is optimized to get a small number of measurements from a large number of people and to try to build a group model. Yeah. And everything in psychophysics and neurophysiology is designed to get a large number of measurements from a small number of individuals and then build individual models. Yeah. So since I'm a neurophysiologist and a psychophysicist, when we started doing MRI, we started from that perspective, which is we're going to model each individual subject. And that's, and that's interesting that, that, I mean, fMRI had enough sensitivity to do that. I mean, like, I also think of, you know, there was this, this, uh, you know, pet imaging, you know, was, was kind of rising up a little bit and you kind of needed more averaging, but, but fMRI has enough sensitivity to get information from individual subjects. Yes. Yeah. I, actually, I should have mentioned that it when, when I said, uh, uh, MRI had a, one of its parents was, you know, or one of its sort of philosophical forebears was uh, clinical imaging. Yes, it's, it was PET imaging, right? In fact, the, the very first statistical methods that were used in MRI and still used today, SPM, that wasn't developed for fMRI, that was developed for PET. Right. So all of those statistics that initially came into fMRI were based on the assumption you have no signal to noise. And the, and the behavioral methods and the, the subject-based methods were also based on the idea you have no signal to noise. So the entire field was built on the assumption that your signal was horrible, when in fact, these machines are miracles of modern technology and the signal's great. 
I mean, that's for what it is, right? So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, that's, and that puts you, uh, yeah. So at Berkeley, uh, starting to do fMRI and, you know, uh, and right away, yeah, you, you had, you know, I remember, I remember the paper with Kendrick K and, and, uh, um, well, that wasn't right away. That was six years. We, right. Right. That <laughs> so was, we, uh, we started doing MRI yeah. in, in 2002. Um, and we built everything from scratch, right? We learned how to program pulse sequences ourselves. We learned how to uh, build all the pre-processing pipeline ourselves. We adapted a lot of that from our neurophysiology work. We had a very sophisticated computational modeling um, framework for single cell neurophysiology and for building encoding models in single cell neurophysiology. And we, which is, excuse me, from the engineering point of view, that's called system identification, which is you treat your neuron like a black box and you build a mathematical equation that describes its transfer function. Yeah. And uh, we uh, adapted all of that to MRI. And that, that took quite a while because, you know, MRI is its, it's, its own unique signal. It's not neurons. Um, it's got its own signal to noise issues and you know its own characteristics and you have to optimize your uh, data processing pipeline for that and so that took a while so that so the 2008 paper that you're referring to was i think probably our third or fourth paper at that point uh but it was yeah certainly the one that made the big impact yeah yeah and so I, let me just uh back up a second you actually so you so so I'm, I'm get, guessing you had like a GE scanner or uh, um, did, so you actually did the pulse programming as well. I mean, that's sort of a, a, a good point to bring out that everyone sort of uses their, you know, whatever clinical pulse sequence is available. You, you did the echoplaner or your group did the. We had a, uh, no, we, we had a Varian scanner. Oh, yeah, Varian. Oh, that's even, oh, that's right. Yeah. I that. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Var Varian was <laughs> a, a, an old MRI company that no longer exists that had two forays into human scanning. Yeah. Um, neither one of them, unfortunately, successful because Varian had management problems. Uh, we were in their second foray into human scanning, and we had a Varian scanner, which was actually a very nice uh, four Tesla scanner. Yeah. Uh, it was bad if you pushed it into the realms of MRI physics, where only an MRI physicist would live. Then you would see its limitations, and it would break down. But yeah. for human functional imaging, it was actually quite good. Yeah, and that was uh, what we learned on, and that that did have a normal. Yeah, I shouldn't say normal. It had an, a, an accessible programming language for programming the pulse sequences. Yeah. Um, and I, I assume the reason you mentioned this is that, that the Siemens scanners that we all use today have a horrible programming language for programming pulse sequences, <laughs> which is uh, called ICE and which uh, requires that you take a two week course just to learn the idiosyncrasies of the language. It's well, not user friendly. Yeah, certainly. And, and that's actually a big problem. I mean, I, I could go on and on for hours for, you know, the big problem with GEN Siemens, I think, is that, you know, they, they have these programming languages that are really outdated and, and idiosyncratic. And also they, they you know, they just care about, I mean, they, rightly so. I mean, their companies, they care about the clinical patients clinic. and they can't yeah. really do their clinical pulse sequences. But the fMRI stuff, you know, you're a little bit on your own. Uh, that's yeah, true. that's true. But, uh, well, yeah. partly that's because fMRI is not used in the clinic. And we oh. can have we could have an hour long conversation about oh, yeah. why that is. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we might get to that at the end. I added a few questions at the end, but uh, but yeah, no, I um, and that's actually a, a a really important question: getting fMRI more used clinically, opening up a clinical market. Then suddenly you'll have, then suddenly the scanners will 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 jump ahead at least ten years in terms of what they can do with fMRI, so pulse yeah. sequences and whatnot. But but anyway, yeah, that, that's one of my main current motivations in in MRI is to move our technology into the clinic. I think it's really important. Yes, I mean in yeah. any any brain dysfunction, uh, developmental or neurological brain dysfunction, must affect brain function. Uh, you know, even if it's like Alzheimer's and it's uh, and it turns out to be due to some plaques, it's still affecting brain function. If it didn't affect brain function, no one would care, yeah. right? It's so, so why aren't we making functional measurements in the clinic? It's crazy. It's a crazy situation. Yeah. Well, actually, well, yeah, before I, <laughs> I, I, this is a really interesting point. I mean, so people right now though, I mean, are doing, I mean, this is something that might be, you know, once again, you, you talk about individual subjects uh, and certainly for pre-surgical mapping, and, and sort of getting information. That's the only case where it's used is pre, right. right. Currently in the clinic is pre-surgical mapping. Right. Right. But, but now people are trying to do, you know, obviously they, they feel let's collect massive amounts of data, do big data analysis to, to gather biomarkers of, you know, templates that sort of help you put an individual subject in the scanner and then compare. Do you think that that, I mean, people worry about that because, you know, there's a reproducibility issue and lack of effect size. You know, you have a person with 
schizophrenia or, or not, or, or any other sort of disorder, um, it's really hard to find the right either probe task or uh, you know, either some sort of physiologic manipulation or, or neural fit manipulation to sort of pull out differences that are manifest in the brain. Yeah, I'm not sure what your what your thoughts on, on that are, but but there's this sensitivity issue in, in terms of, you know, yes, we can deeply understand the brain, we can scan one subject a lot and 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 make really precise models. But if we just stick a, a, a random person in the scanner, can we say anything about them? Uh, that seems like a, a, a more of a question of, you know, how do we cut through, reduce the dimensionality of the data such that we can separate the disorder cleanly uh, and, and or... Well, the problem is what is the information you have to go on? Uh, if all of your information is low dimensional, if you've, if you've reduced the dimensionality of your paradigm and your data set before you ever collected data by instituting a very limited stimulus and task, then you have no way to explore outside that subspace. Yeah. You're inevitably limited to that subspace. So if you made a wrong guess, and that's really what most of psychology and neuroscience is, a guess. If you made a wrong guess, you're just screwed. There's yeah. nothing you can do. You can't recover it. It's gone. Yes. So these uh, efforts to collect, at, at some point, if you want to build a functional MRI method, like I'm talking about functional biomarkers here, but it could be biological as well. Yeah. Um, if, you want to, if you want to build, I mean, the nice thing about biology is if you just want to build biological biomarkers, you know, you, you can just collect anatomical data or whatever the biological pulse sequence is, you know, you want to collect and there's no stimulus or task involved. So that's fine. You, in that case, just going for the broad paradigm, sorry, excuse me, the, the large sample size is fine. Yeah. But in functional imaging, you're not just collecting, well, I mean, we can get into resting state, but, uh, you know, it, I mean, the bottom line is, um, you know, usually there's, there's always a stimulus and a task for the brain, right? Whether you manipulate it or not, there is always a stimulus and a task. Even in resting state, if I'm right, there is a stimulus and yeah. there is a task. You just didn't control it. Yeah. You don't know what it is. doing it? something, right? <laughs> Their brain is not shut off. Usually they're talking to themselves, but there, there's definitely a stimulus and a task. So there's always a stimulus and a task. And if you if you either don't control the stimulus and task, or you uh, constrain the stimulus and task so much that you're just working in a really really tiny subspace, then um, you can't get information about anything else. Yeah. Yeah. And so I have very strong objections to people putting the cart before the horse and collecting these really large data sets on. Um, subjects where either they don't know anything about the stimulus or task because they didn't control it, or it's a very small subspace because we, we have no idea whether and no way to determine yes. whether that data is actionable and, and how much was lost. Yeah. Maybe we'll lead into it. Um, movies in the scanner then something like that, some sort of, well, that would be one thing. Okay. Um, but you know, there are more complicated things you could do, right? You could have somebody, uh, play a video game in the scanner would probably, right? The more realistic the video game was, the probably the better off you would be. Yes. Um, what the, what you want. So, so I, I kind of have this, um, again, it goes back to this, my kind of general engineering point of view about everything we do. Um, I tend to think of the, my philosophy is that you should optimize your MRI experiment to get the maximum amount of information through your system, sort of per unit time money graduate student, right? And, um, the, and you can think of this as a mutual information problem. You've got some information in the brain and that information is going to be filtered through whatever stimulus and task you pick. So that's the sort of source of the information in this, in this paradigm is, is the brain dotted with the stimulus and task. Yeah. And, and then on the other end, you've got your computer, which is where you want the information to be so that you can model it. Right? So in the middle, unfortunately, between the source, which is the brain and the stimulus and the task, and the sink, which is the computer, you've got this little tiny straw that is sucking out some vanishingly small fraction of the bits yeah. in the yeah. brain into your computer. And that straw is the limitation in this paradigm, right? So, so what you want is, given the straw that you're, you've got, which is essentially the MRI machine that you have, you know, you can't get past the MRI machine. It's just, it's, the, it's the brain measurement device. Um, given that straw, how can you maximize the number of bits of mutual information you get between the brain and the stimulus and the task and the computer per unit time money? Right? Yeah, yeah. And if you are doing exploratory research, which you are, if you're trying to find biomarkers for schizophrenia or autism spe spectrum disorder, 
that's exploratory research. Nobody has a clue what those biomarkers should be. Yeah. So in that case, you uh, need to sample broadly from the stimulus and task space because um, you, you uh, otherwise you're, you have no guarantee that you're going to find the right subspace that will optimize your ability to do diagnosis, prognosis, and monitoring. Yes. And, and if you're going to sample the, uh, the stimulus and task space broadly, you can't use the standard paradigms because they're not optimized for that. All the standard paradigms used in MRI are optimized for reduced dimensionality experiments yeah. because they're all designed to do hypothesis testing. Yeah. So you can't think of this as a hypothesis testing thing. You need to think of this as a data-driven experiment. And data-driven experiments are, and, and data-driven sort of science and engineering is very different from hypothesis-driven science and engineering. Yes. So it's sort of like discovery science in some sense, what people call it, but maybe that's not exactly the same, but yeah. So the data-driven sort of- uh, Yeah, I'm not really sure what discovery science is. But. Yeah, I, mean, I actually, to be honest, <laughs> I don't know exactly out. where it's it like is, but I hear, that, I hear that term thrown out in terms of the idea that you have this massive database and you're, and, but more important than what you say is more important is that how you make that database is more important than just having a lot of, a large database. And so, yeah, the, the, because, because we're in the, the limited data regime, right? If you're Google and you're, if, if you're a, a Google deep brain, right? And you want to uh, just collect a huge amount of data and, you know, analyze that data. Well, you're, you're going to be at the saturation point of the data. You can get as much data as you want and there's no end to it. And so um, you can basically just do everything in a Bayesian framework. You don't need a hypothesis. You can find the <laughs> optimal solution. Right, right. But but we are not in that regime. We are in the limited data regime. So we are like in the Venn diagram of death, where we have um, we have a very high degree of uncertainty about what the system's doing. Like all you know, the the one the first law of neuroscience is whatever your hypothesis is about what the how the brain works, it's wrong. Right? We, we know this, <laughs> and, and we know this because any time anybody has ever taken a hypothesis about the brain and like tried to predict what the brain does, they're they're horrible at it. I mean, yeah. Unless it's some, you know, really trivial brain area like primary visual cortex. So, which I work on. I, I don't want I don't want the vision people to think like I'm trivializing visual cortex. I'm a vision guy, okay? But it is the dumbest part of the brain. So, they're the dumbest part of the cortex, okay? Yeah. So, we're in the Venn diagram of death where we've got this huge high degree of uncertainty and very, very limited data sets. So, you can't, my personal point of view is you don't want to go down the hypothesis testing route because uh, the trouble is, most of your hypotheses are wrong. And in, in the hypothesis testing framework, if your hypothesis proves to be wrong, there is no way to determine what you should do next. Yeah. There, are no, there are no rules for that. Yes. Uh, and you can't go down the purely data-driven framework, purely data-driven, because you don't have infinite data. Yes. So you have to optimize between these two things. And there's a complicated trade-off that you need to go negotiate and you need to be smart about. Yeah. I'm you, just repeating what you said. So. Right, right, right. No, no, actually, that's done in a really... It's, I like your setup uh, and, and sort of defining a problem. I mean, that's sort of what we're, you know, we're trying to find these large databases and people debate, they should debate more about what, what types of experiments go into the databases and what's, what, what are, what's a, like a, a loose hypothesis and some, or a broad enough set of hypothesis that you can actually have, cast a wide net to sort of. Or what's a broad enough paradigm that will allow you to formulate hypotheses, right? Yeah. So, um, for example, imagine people are playing um, Grand Theft Auto in the MRI machine. Okay, probably have a video game that a lot of people are familiar with. Um, okay, what, what hypothesis? Okay, so you got a bunch of data. They played Grand Theft Auto. You have all the ground truth. They were playing the video game. You know exactly what they saw. You know what they were doing. You know what they did in the past. You know what they did in the future. You yeah. know what the task in the game is if they're following the, the storyline. You know when they went off task. Okay, what hypotheses can you generate in with that data set? And when you think about it, there's a huge number of hypotheses you could generate right. involving vision, planning, moral reasoning, emotional reactions, <laughs> right? Yeah. Motor responses, anything. There are hundreds and hundreds of hypotheses in that data set yeah. that are all quantifiable and all expressible mathematically, not just by the seat of your pants, and all perfectly uh, testable with that data set. This is one example. What yeah, mean. to the extent that they're separable. I mean, there's not sort of nonlinear interactions. Thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> that is all, true for every experiment ever. Right. So if you if you if you say, oh, these hypotheses are too interactive, and I don't, and I, they're not really separable. Well, okay, you can do a reduced paradigm to just test one hypothesis. 
But in the real world, that hypothesis yeah. is going to interact with all the other things anyway. So yeah. you cannot avoid the fact that the brain is a highly interactive, nonlinear, dynamical system. I mean, this reminds me on some level of, you know, how do you get, you know, I remember thinking about the best possible auditory stimulus and it was like something like ripple noise. So there's some, it's not a pure frequency. It's not broad frequency. It's some sort of mix, some mix uh, in that sense. So this is sort of like a behavioral ripple noise in some sense where you, you, you want to have something that, that stimulates a lot of things that, that has enough of that, that you can actually have these hypotheses in some sense. Right. But, but, but again, you're, you're, you're going to be data limited. So you can't, you know, uh, because we're data limited, you can't test everything. Right. So you have to pick a subspace and, yes. and you, you want that subspace to be as big as possible. So, you know, one of the big things that we're doing, we've been doing in the lab the last several years is an, uh, just a navigation experiment where uh, we built a, we used Unreal Engine to build a small city, uh, it's, uh, maybe, I don't know, four square kilometers on a side, four kilometers on a side. There's about 200 buildings in this city. Uh, it's got country parts and city parts. It's got urban areas and suburban areas. And there's, uh, it's run using an autonomous driving framework called Carla that's used by the EE community to build autonomous vehicles in a virtual world before they set them loose in the human world. <laughs> and and uh, okay. this, so uh, it takes about, believe it or not, 10 hours for people to learn this town. Uh, oh. just driving around it, trying to learn all the landmarks. It's a big city. Okay? Yeah. Or, 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 so it's a big town. And then um, we put them in the MRI machine and they do an Uber task. We tell them, okay, you're at the Taco Bell, drive to the gas station. They have to drive to the gas station. And, and there's other traffic in here and there's pedestrians in here and there's there's daytime and nighttime and weather, there's rain. And, yeah. um, uh, and that's the task. And that is a great task for tickling all of the navigation systems through the entire brain. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Does, is it is it good for um, emotional intelligence? Well, probably not great, right. unless the other cars are trying to run into you yeah. or the yeah, pedestrians then... are wandering across the street, right? <laughs> but you know, it, it's not gonna it's not gonna be good for all of the brain subsystems. But it's certainly for navigation, it's a great task. Yeah. So that that is the kind of thing you would you could think about. Like if you're interested in social cognition, you might uh, create a, a social task. And if you're interested in um, gambling, you know, you'd have people play hold them. Online. Yeah. 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 It seems like there's a, there's a, I mean, there's a lot of work along those lines, but it's all kind of scattered and it seems like there could be like an entire field of like paradigm design for, you know, let's say for fMRI or whatever. I mean, that sort of advances the science of, of, how, of, you know, how do you get what systems and making sort of a science of it in some sense, but, um, well, you're thinking, you're thinking like an MRI physicist. So, uh, <laughs> And I, I don't mean to insult you, Peter, but um, I'm, this is going to sound insulting. Yeah, no, um, no, I'm uh, fine. <laughs> so, so MRI, uh, I think one of the dysfunctions of MRI is a necessary dysfunction, which is these machines are very, very complicated. No human can both build an MRI machine and do good MRI experiments. It's just too, there's just too much you have to know. So the field becomes balkanized where you have the developers who are either the hardware developers or the software developers, and then you have the users. And my complaint about that system of any science that, that requires that is it makes the users stupid yep. because the users don't have to actually understand the machine. Yeah. In fact, I think one of the worst things that ever happened to MRI is you guys, you MRI physicists made it too easy for people to do dumb MRI experiments. Press scan. Yeah. Press scan. Exactly. <laughs> that is not a benefit to science um, because if people are clueless about their instrument, they will collect bad data. So um, being an old neurophysiologist, when I used to pull my own electrodes, my view is like, you know, you need to build an amplifier, you build your amplifier. You don't know how to build an amplifier, you learn how to build an amplifier, right? right? Everything, yeah, you, know, exactly. you do everything yourself. And the advantage of that, it, it, it makes science very slow, which is horrible. But the advantage is, you know what you're doing. You really know what you're doing. So I don't think actually we should have a separate group that is designing these paradigms. I think- Right, no, I agree. I, yeah. That I, was where I was going on that. Okay, okay. I, was, <laughs> I totally agree with you though. Not a separate group, but more- a kind of a discipline of where you're, where the people who do the experiments sort of get trained in, or maybe this, you know, uh, an, an area where we're cross-disciplinary, where people learn. That I completely agree with you. I mean, I think one of the big uh, problems, well, this is, this is not just a problem with fMRI. This is a problem with uh, biology. One of the big problems we have in biology and psychology is that people are not trained in data science at all. 
They're yep. trained in 1950s statistics. Every, if you open up your typical psychology journal, every statistic that's reported in that journal and every method of doing the data analysis had already been developed by the 1950s. Yep. And since biologists, until recently, were not required to take any statistics courses, the way they learned to do statistics is they talked to their psychology friend and just did whatever they told them to do. So mm -hmm. biology is also infested with, you know, t-tests and, and, you know, uh, stuff that's perfectly fine for its purposes, but is very, very old and very weak. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll tell this real, just really quick story. I know I'm going off the, yeah, no, off the this is uh, great. page here a bit. Um, <laughs> this is going to, this is going to seem like another one of these non sequiturs that, but, but I'll, it has a point. Um, there's another field adjacent to neuroscience called artificial intelligence. And, you know, we're all very excited about artificial intelligence today because it seems like it's successful. But I'm an old geezer, and I remember when artificial intelligence was useless, and everybody laughed at it. And actually, from its inception in World War II until the 1990s, AI was just uh, uh, was the worst place in science. I mean, they studied really interesting problems. They never got anywhere. Nobody believed anything anybody did, and nothing was replicable. It was really bad. And yeah. eventually what happened is the AI people figured out what the problem is. You know, science, science is basically just, it's humans and humans are flawed. Um, you know, scientists are just as irrational as any other human. The only reason science works is we have a social paradigm that requires that eventually whatever crazy ideas we come up with have to explain the data. Yeah. And the data is what keeps us honest fundamentally, right? Yeah. Um, so science, I oftentimes say, is politics with data. And if we didn't have the data, we, it would just be as dysfunctional as Congress. Okay, right. But because we have the data, it keeps us honest. <laughs> but AI does, doesn't have any data, right? So the AI people realized, hey, wait a minute, we got a problem here. We've got politics, but no data. Well, isn't it performance? Isn't it, like, uh, isn't it just simple performance of AI? Isn't it simply, you know, how effective? Now, now, oh, okay. but it wasn't then. Right? Wow. So in the 90s, the field realized we have a problem. We need to do something because we don't have data. We don't have any objective truth that we're pinning our, our, our things on. We can't even compare what we're doing to one another. We can't make progress. Everything just ends up being a local tower of blocks that gets knocked over when the next guy shows up. Yeah. So in the 90s, really over a period of about 10 years, the AI community came up with a whole set of standards and a paradigm for for making sure that they were doing solid science. And, you know, it, what, they weren't alone in this, you know, the computer science people and the statistics people, and they were all working together on this informally. And what developed sort of organically over a period of 10 to 20 years was a really great framework for data science that ensured that people could do experiments, could replicate things. Uh, the, they were minimizing type one and type two error. And more, most importantly of all, and this is something that's really lacking in biology and psychology, they were focused on performance, not statistical significance. They were focused on prediction accuracy and generalization. Yeah. And fundamentally, the only reason the government gives us money is that we can build models that predict and generalize. Yeah. The government does not give us money for statistical significance, that nobody would do that. That's crazy. Statistical <laughs> significance is the noise floor, right? Yes. Finding a significant result just means your data is not random. Yeah. It doesn't mean it's worth anything. Yeah. So um, all of that paradigm has now in the modern world turned into something we call data science. Okay. And it's at, at, and there are a lot of lessons in data science that are very easy to port into psychology and biology and which basically have not been ported at all. To yeah. take the simplest one, sorry, <laughs> that's the last thing I'll say. To take the simplest one, the one thing they learned in data science very quickly is always separate your fit and test data set. Do not ever, ever, ever run statistics on your fit data set because you will always overfit. Yeah. I have been yelling at people about this for 20 years in psychology and biology. To this day, as far as I know, in psychology, there's only one lab, behavioral lab, that actually uses separate fit and test data sets to do their ANOVAs, <laughs> which, you know, ANOVA is just, just regression. Like you can separate your fit and test data sets, right? So, yes. uh, you know, there's just there's this whole idea of like, Trying to separate your fit and test data sets to minimize type one and type two error and to make sure that you generalize 
outside the noise is is just is just foreign in the field. And MRI is the same way. People don't separate fit and test data sets in MRI either. Well, what 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 isn't that coming more common, to but... what what happened a few years ago though with the double dipping uh, uh, controversy that. Um, isn't that something that isn't, isn't, isn't that related uh, in that regard? The double dipping controversy is a valid controversy. And the solution to that was perfectly reasonable, but the double dipping problem is only one aspect of this problem. Okay. It's a different, it's a different failure to separate fit and test data sets. Okay. Basically the double dipping problem is uh, identifying an ROI for further analysis based on uh, using, using one test to identify an ROI and then using a non-independent data set that you test on that ROI. Yeah, right? so you, you find the ROI based on the test and then you say, hey, look, the ROI shows that, uh, you know, the, what we are looking for. <laughs> right, in some sense. right, um, right. That's the, that's the most egregious example of this, but every single statistic that's ever run on an MRI data set should have a separate fit and test data set. Yes, yes. And yeah. that is not routinely done. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing how, right. I mean, you, you're right. I mean, I think that uh, data science, the, the the basic tenets of data science need to be sort of propagated. And and the obvious way to do this to for is to have the journals refuse to accept papers that don't adhere to this to these methods. Yes. I would do that if I was dictator of the world. But unfortunately, the journals, remember, are not, they're also not neutral arbiters here. The journals are fundamentally selling a product to the scientists, which is a place to publish their papers. Well, and um, so they can't just cut everybody off, you know, one day and say, hey, you gotta, gotta separate your fit and test data sets. Well, I'll have, to, I'll have to push back slightly for that. I mean, I, I, you know, it was an editor of NeuroImage and, and honestly, I have to say that we never thought of, oh, they're not gonna like NeuroImage if we reject their paper. We, we always, I think we at least had an idea that we're just here to, to make sure the science is good. Um, I think at the editor level, the editors, they don't care whether the journal sells or not. I mean, they, they don't care. They just want to, at least for them. Yeah, yeah but, but, you know, this is, this is a chicken and egg problem. If you have a field where um, people have never been trained to, in, in modern methods of data science, and the journal is not enforcing any requirements that they adhere to modern methods of right. data science, then how are things ever going to get better? Yes, I, I completely agree. And, okay. and I actually, I think that's a, and I think it's changing a little bit as people get, there's more experts that permeate the field. I think it's, I think it's a matter also of expertise for editors like, well, I, I'm not sure how to judge this. Well, that, that's why I was saying that ju- the, the, the journals, I think, just have to make policy. Yes. I mean, uh, the, the, again, going, um, since I've been fighting this battle a long time, a lot of the experts in the field are essentially fighting the last battle. So for example, in MRI, one thing that people have done a lot on and very successfully is reducing type one error by, um, for example, stopping double dipping and by uh, using FDR correction for their statistics, right? And so there's been a lot of advances in reducing type one error by making the statistical significance paradigm more valid. Yeah. But again, statistical significance is necessary, but not sufficient for doing science, right? right. Science, is, science is essentially, it's got three stages. You measure some stuff, you build a model of that stuff, hopefully whose dimensionality is lower than the stuff you measured, yeah. right? And then you use that model to predict new stuff. Yeah. And if you only have statistical significance, you cannot predict new stuff necessarily. Yeah. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. And that whole prediction paradigm doesn't even exist in yeah almost any journal, right? There's no requirement to predict anything, to show predictions. Yeah, that's a, that's a really a, a really good point. And I think that people have, you know, some sort of rough idea in their mind that, you know, they're, they have a model in their mind, but they're just testing the significance of something, but they're not really, what you're saying is actually formal models of, um, well, let's actually talk a little bit about that. It's not, it's not only formal models, hang on, just one, one okay. last thing. Yeah. I am arguing that even if you're just reporting a statistical significant result, I wanna know your effect size. And I want to know your effect size, Definitely. meaning your prediction accuracy, in a separate data set. Yes. It can be in the same paradigm. Even. Like, yeah. I don't, I'm not even requiring a generalization test here. I'm like, this is the lowest bar. Tell yeah. me how much of the variance in a, in a test data set you are predicting. And nobody is required to report that. And in fact, I'll tell you another <laughs> weird story, which is uh, many years ago, this would have been about 15 years ago now, we once reported a neurophysiology paper where we reported statistical significant results and we reported how much of the variance each of, uh, we could predict for each neuron. And nobody had ever done this in this brain area before. And we sent the journal paper in and uh, 
the reviews came back and said, your model isn't good enough. It's not predicting enough of the variance. And we responded explaining, but no one has ever tried to predict variance before in this brain area. So how do you know it's there? There's, you can't say we're not predicting enough of the variance because nobody ever reports this metric. Yes. And they said, no, 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 it's just too low a number. So we actually <laughs> removed from the paper all predictions of variance and okay. just sent the paper in with statistical significance and they accepted the paper. Yeah, that's not right. You know science is messed up when they are willing to accept a paper with less information. Yeah. That, that relies a fundamental <laughs> misunderstanding of how science works. Yeah, so, so you would recommend, just, to, just so people understand exactly what you're saying, you would recommend that, for instance, if you have, um, you know, whatever, some sort of task and you, you, you show us maps of significance, which I actually, I prefer maps of effect size of some sort, but- um, They should be both. Right. Yeah, you can you have both. Do both. Right. One's a noise ceiling and one's a noise floor. Yeah. One thing people, you know, with MRI, I mean, you have a lot of things that you're measuring sort of a fit, like for instance, in your encoding models, for instance, you're measuring, you're, you're mapping, uh, you know, some sort of fit to a regressor. So when you say a fit to regressor, what would be your effect size? Uh, what would be, what would be your effect size if you, if you looked at the, like that, like if you're making a map, a re, you know, you have a complicated aggressor based on some sort of naturalistic stimulus and you're make, making a voxelwise map, the effect size itself would be, would be what uh, with that? Okay, so, so I should just point out that all of fMRI is regression, right? It's right. just an issue of whether your model's explicit or not. If you're, if you're just doing a t-test, it's just a regression. Test is regression. But, you know, everything's regression in, in science for the most part. So yes. in, in, in biology and psychology and neuroscience. Yep. So, um, so you know, our regression models are no different than anybody else's regression models, except they're more explicit, right? Yes. Most people have a hypothesis and they use that hypothesis to constrain their experiment. And then since their experiment is only in a subspace, they can just do a t-test. Our, our experiments tend to be more complicated. So we can't just we can't just do a t-test. There's nothing to t-test on. Yes. So we have to build an encoding model, which means we um, essentially do something called linearized regression, where we take the stimulus and task data, the fMRI brain activity data, and we project it non-linearly usually into some hypothesis relevant subspace yeah. where the relationship between this subspace and the bold signals that we record are presumed to be linear. And then we use linear regression to fit that half of the model. Yeah. So you can think of these encoding models as being hypotheses. Yeah. They're just hypotheses that are created after we do the collect the data rather than before we collect the data. Yes. Okay. Okay. And because we're creating these hypotheses after we collect the data, it's very, very important that we separate fit and test data. Yeah. So in our paradigms, we always collect a separate data set with test data. We do all of our modeling on the fit data set. And then we uh, always test on the test data set. And when we test on the test data set, we're looking for two things. A, is this thing statistically significant? And, you know, we have good, great paradigm statistical significance. We just use FDR corrected statistical significance, just like everybody else. Yeah. And if our, if our voxels, if our model, our feature space or our linearized model or our encoding model, whatever you want to call it, is statistically significant, then we know that the relationship between the X variables, which are the brain activity and the Y variables, which are, excuse me, the X variables, which are the stimulus and task and the Y variables, which are our brain activity. We know that that relationship through this subspace or through this hypothesis yeah. is not random. So then now we have to do another test, which is, well, how much of the variance are we explaining? Yeah. And the thing to remember here is our test data set is not infinite. It's finite. Our test data is not the true, our, our test data set is a sample. It's mm -hmm. not the population mean. But any model we fit is going to predict the population response, not the sample response. Okay. So given that we only have a sample in our test data set, we are actually never going to predict all of the variance in the test data set. We can't because it's a sample and the sample mean is not the same as the population. mean. And the difference between the sample mean and the population mean is given by the standard error. So what you in effect do is you look at your sample of test data, you calculate the standard error on that test data, and you use that to adjust the noise ceiling. You use that to predict or to um, estimate how much of the variance the best possible model could explain. Okay. So for example, if you're in a normal MRI experiment, you might say, okay, well, I've, I've got this test data, this test data has a certain amount of variance, but I can only, the best model in the world can only explain 70% of that variance because of the noise in this test data. Okay. Right, the intrinsic noise, the standard error. Yes. So now I take my model and I predict in this test data set. 
the best model in the world predicts 70%. My model predicts 40%. I know exactly how close I am to getting the optimal model. Yeah. I have four sevenths there, right? right. So, right. so that's, that's, how, that's how this is done. So now we have both a noise floor, which is I've got a significant result, and a percent variance explained, which is yeah. in this case, four sevenths. Okay. The methods for doing this are, have all been worked out. They've all been worked out in neurophysiology. All of this comes from neurophysiology literature. I did a lot of this work early on with Frederick Tunison and Axel Boris and other people. There's a paper you can look at back from 2005 that Frederick Tunison has author on. Recently, uh, Manish Sahani at UCL has done a lot of, published a really nice review of these like noise ceiling estimation algorithms. And you can, you can check that out there. But all, mm -hmm. all of this literature has already been worked out very, very well in the neurophysiology literature and can be adapted directly to MRI. Okay. Well, this is, uh, that's great. That's great. Um, uh, and I think actually it, it's the field, you know, as we struggle with, with these things, I mean, it's much more, it's, it's important to actually learn a lot, learn more as much as we can from electrophysiology and, and sort of take into consideration these effects. Because I think actually, yeah, you're right. I mean, part of the a big problem is that FRI works so well that you just, you, you, you know, the, the impulse is that you do an experiment, you see something and you feel maybe, I, I mean, I, just for myself, it's like, you feel like, oh, if you can see the results or, or somehow um, you just need to throw any statistical test, to, you know, obviously you need to model the noise as well as possible, but upping the, the rigor, especially when you ask these more subtle questions is, is important, but okay, let me just pursue a little bit further with uh, your encoding models, because, um, and that and there's a really interesting part of fMRI. So it's related to even what you were saying in terms of how do you design an experiment? Um, so, so what I really liked about your, your studies with the semantic space. So, so for instance, there, there's a paper, you, several papers you wrote along the lines of, you have these either podcasts or, uh, you know, the moth podcasts or, or, or movies. And now you're doing navigation and, and, and doing other things that, that are sort of these enriched stimuli and you you basically break down the stimuli into regressors right, which are all hypothesis and then and then you you look at uh, how the brains respond and and then you you, you basically say well you know there's areas that respond to certain aspects more than others and the maps that you create and so so what I found there's two questions I, I, I was what really wanted to ask with this podcast one one is are there along the lines of what we were talking about you use this encoding model but it's it seems that it would be nice to be able to, I always worry that even with trying to define the stimulus as well as you can, you're still missing something. And it seems like there's some people actually use like, for instance, cross subject cor correlation. If they have a time lock stimulus, they pull everything out. And that's not perfect either because you really don't know exactly what you're pulling out. But if you iterate between that, you might be able to build better models of, you know, forward models of, of what's going on. Uh, that's an interesting part. The other part of this is, what you found in terms of your semantic space, it seems like it's it sort of blows people away a little bit when they, you know, the, you're, you're, many neuroscientists, when they look at this, they think, oh, what, what's going on here? You know, we know where the language area is. We know where the cognitive control area is. We know uh, this is sort of like suggesting that semantic processing is uh, distributed, even, even object processing to some degree um, is distributed much more diffusely in the brain. So I'm not sure which one of those you want to you want to talk about first, but I thought it would be interesting to to discuss both those points. Well, we can we can deal with all of those. That's all the right. points. First <laughs> off, I just want to point out that anybody who says, "Oh, we know where the language areas are," problem solved, is like deluding themselves. Okay. <laughs> that that is factually cannot that claim cannot be made because no one has done just for in a language task. People haven't done prediction and generalization tests. Okay. So you can say in my dumb experiment that I did where I had people <laughs> where I, I had people listen to single words, right? Then I know where the language area is. That's a valid, logically valid statement. Saying from that experiment, I know where the language area is, is not a valid statement. Right. Well, I mean, like you have you, you know, even going back to lesion studies, you have, you know, Wernicke's area, Broca's area, whatever. I mean, that's but then there's goes beyond that. But but lesion studies, like any scientific experiment, are only probing a subspace. Lesion studies are great at identifying bottlenecks. In other words, nodal points in this complicated brain network where if you lesion them, everything falls apart. They're fantastic at that. Yes. But lesion studies are horrible at identifying, localizing, and explaining brain lesions that occur in a part of the network that's not, a, that's not one of these nodal points, that's not totally one of these great. bottlenecks. Yeah, that's a really good point. Most strokes 
they don't actually affect anything in particular. They just make you get lousy at everything because they, they, they affect some part, random part of the brain that can be essentially bypassed by this richly connected network, right? Right. I mean, do you think that the extent that it's on a network, I mean, Michael Fox is sort of is, is working, you know, he's, a, he's basically looking at these lesions and how they're related to all, you know, to a network in some sense and uh, well, you know, predicts. Well, how, but he's probably doing functional networks, right? Yes. Yeah. So we can have we can have a whole conversation about that, okay. which is uh, that's a, that's an adjacent um, uh, issue to uh, cross subject correlations. And, okay. and if you want to if you want to hear me rant for eight hours straight, that's a that's a good topic. <laughs> to take. So so I just I just want to point out, like, you know, the, the brain the, the, I told you earlier that the first law of neuroscience is that uh, we don't know, you know, what the right hypothesis is. That's actually the second law of neuroscience. The first law of neuroscience is the brain is complicated. So we know the brain is more complicated than, you know, we can conceive. The brain's a non-dynamical system. In engineering and math and physics, the one thing that we cannot model well is non-dynamical systems. Even if we had all of the information from all of the neurons in the brain, we would have no mathematical framework for modeling those data currently, but we have the double whammy, which is we don't have any math to describe this system adequately, and we can't measure it because neuroscience is fundamentally measurement limited. We're working on a really hard problem here, and um, we have to use the best tools we can, but we can't be going around deluding ourselves, pretending that we're victorious. You know? right. Science, again, is politics, and so, of course, it's in an individual scientist's interest to claim that they are right and that they have all the answers. But I think it's very important, even if you're a, a shameless politician, to always remember that you're being a shameless politician, that really the, the result is you actually don't know very well. <laughs> and for 99% of the results reported in the neurobiology, MRI, psychology literature, there's no, there is no uh, prediction and there's no generalization test. And we therefore have no idea how much of the variance of the function of this organ in the real world is actually being explained by these models. There's, yeah. just no, there's just no information about it because no journal ever requires that people report these numbers, even, yeah. even to do a superficial test. They're just not reported. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, I, I know we keep going back to this issue, but it, as you can no, tell, no. I think it's a very important issue. I think it's a, fundamentally, it's a fundamental issue in the philosophy of science where we have essentially, as a collective community, we have gamed the system uh, such that we are pretending that significance is importance. Yeah. And it's obvious why that happens because it's way easier to get statistical significance than it is to get a model that actually predicts. Right. And so the whole field has, has moved from the original idea of statistical significance, which is that it's just one of the many things you would do with your data to that being the hallmark of the target that you shoot at, right? And yes. that has not been good for the field. And I just refuse to play that game. Yeah, no, I think actually I, li I like that I like that construct, um, and, I, and I think that so many people don't think about that. And I think that they—I mean, it would be interesting to even, you know, maybe who knows—a future podcast um, we should talk about. Um, when you explain this to people, they will all admit this is true. But then, if you wait to see who does something about it, nobody does anything about it. Yeah, and it would so. be worthwhile talking about mechanisms for doing something, as opposed to just telling them to do it. It would be interesting to sort of teach people, or maybe even examples of, of good papers that do it. Well, ones that don't. I, um, I'm not trying to be too narcissistic here, but read any of our papers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you're right, because then you know, then you actually, well, okay, let's let's take that a little bit further. Okay, let's see. Well, wait, now, do you want to get stuck in this local minimum for long, larger, for longer than we have? Because you asked two other questions here, too. Yeah, I asked two other questions. Um, <laughs> It's up to you. Yeah, it's your where podcast. Where to go? Where to go? Um, let's just go with these two questions, and then and then we'll circle back maybe if we have, to, okay. if we have time. So okay, the, maybe the first question: um, other methods of of you know is encoding. What's the limitations of that, and uh, right. uh, and how you might be able to iterate you know with other sort of uh, methods assumptions. Right. So the thing to remember about encoding models is it's just regression. <laughs> There's nothing, an encoding model is just a regression model. It's just a name for another name for regression. Yep. It, it encompasses a subset of regression, right? Yep. It doesn't encompass decoding, it encompasses encoding. It's a forward model where you have your X variables are the stimulus and task and uh, your Y variables are the brain data. That's an, anything that models that relationship is an encoding model. Usually encoding models are, are that, that framework is applied to a model that is, 
that it, that involves some sort of linearized regression where there's a transformation of the of the stimulus and task space into some new feature space and then regression is applied uh, as opposed to just doing you know if you if you just had a task where you know classic canvasher task where you show faces versus places and you fit fit a regression model because that's what you're always going to do yeah. well that's in some sense an encoding model they're just not usually called encoding models, yeah, but exactly. it's still regression right you think of encoding models when you think of a more rich stimulus system. yeah yeah that that tends to be the situation where it's used but you know right. i am not i'm a, all, the ultimate pragmatist i'm not a yeah. purist i just yeah. want things to be done well and you know you can, you can use encoding models in whatever format you want as long as you do that as long as you do it right um so do they miss stuff well of course they miss stuff everything misses stuff Every scientific method has its own advantages and disadvantages. Yeah. The thing that I like about encoding models and the reason we use them for the most part in the lab is they have two great advantages that many other methods don't. The first is uh, that they make all of the assumptions of your pipeline and your theory explicit. Yes. You, you can't hide anything. In most uh, psychology experiments, the psychologist has a theory. It may be a mathematical theory, but more often it's a woolly, vague theory. And they kind of intuit what a relevant experiment would be for that theory. And they judge the merit of their theory based on statistical significance. You yeah. can't do that with encoding models. Everything has to be uh, defined in a computer program or in math. Yes. which is you know the same thing. I like the fact that you cannot hide from an encoding model. There's no, there's no, there may be a hunch, but you are required to take that intuition or that hunch and reify it as a specific uh, feature space. Yeah. And, and that I think is a huge advantage because it keeps you from kidding yourself. Avoiding self-delusion is an important, I think it should be an important goal for all scientists. I totally agree. <laughs> there's a second thing which we have not discussed yet and which, is, which gets into the topic of functional connectivity and cross-subject correlations, which is encoding models statistically separate signal from noise. And they do this because encoding models are a regression framework. Yeah. All regression can be viewed as um, in a Bayesian framework where you have a, a model frame or a, a model frame or a model form, which is essentially the, the space that your model could occupy. You have a noise model and you have a set of parameters that uh, apply that model form to your observed data under that noise model. Yes. Right? And every sort of Bayesian model has these three components. Regression has these three components. Um, and since an encoding model is regression, it has these three components. In other words, when you fit an encoding model, because it has an underlying model of the noise, which in modern MRI is the Gaussian noise model, and that's because uh, all MRI pre-processing does is it removes any noise that's not Gaussian and it yeah. retains the Gaussian noise. Yeah. So you know, I, I should mention that I also hate this and this is not optimal and we should not be doing this as a field, okay. but I don't have a solution for this yet, so I won't complain about it any further today. Yeah. So we okay. pre-process our data and ended up with Gaussian data. So I know my noise model is a Gaussian noise model. So now I can fit my encoding model under the Gaussian noise model and come up with an optimal set of parameters with the noise removed. Right, right. Functional connectivity can't do that. Let's just take fun resting state functional connectivity, okay? I put somebody in the MRI machine. I tell them, don't think about anything, just rest here. So you know what they do, they talk to themselves. When do I get out of this MRI machine? God, am I gonna get paid 50 bucks? Oh, I'm hungry. Oh, my head hurts. This thing's really loud, right? Okay. So they, so resting state MRI is oftentimes very closely aligned with the rumination network, but still whatever, there's, there's data. Yeah. Now I wanna analyze this data. Well, I don't have any X variables because I didn't control the stimulus or task. I only have the Y variables. There are methods for analyzing data when you only have the Y variables and they consist of looking at the correlations of the Y variables. If that's the only data you have, it's a perfectly valid approach. Yeah. So I look at the correlations of the Y variables and I get a correlation matrix. And then if I wanna like fancy it up, I might take that correlation matrix and threshold it and turn it into a graph. Okay. I don't have to, some people do, some people don't, yep. it's whatever. What is in that data matrix? What is in that functional correlation matrix? Well, signal and noise, yes. which is signal and which is noise. You don't know, you have no way to know. There's no way to separate those things. That thing has a bunch of noise in it and you have no idea where that noise is. Now, if the noise is stationary, meaning it's exactly the same between all the voxels or all the ROIs and it's exactly the same over time, well, that doesn't really matter because it's just gonna be additive. Right. But that's not how noise is. <laughs> yeah, and I think actually, right, what people implicitly do is they, they start to look at the spatial structure of the correlation matrix um, and then see how that spatial structure then corresponds to the, the anatomy. 
And so from, you know, they sort of build this. Yeah, they try to use the anatomy as a prior. Yeah. That's still not going to get rid of noise. That will just allow you to infer ROIs. They won't be correct ROIs because, of course, anatomy is necessary but not sufficient for constraining functional areas. Yeah. If you do enough tests, though, over time, like let's say you do enough tests. I mean, let's say you you have a sliding window correlation matrix or something like that. If you look at the the noises that propagates over t- in, in repeated tests over time, then you can start to make samples in that That way. will, you may be able to remove some of the noise components that way, but will you be able to remove, you won't even be able to remove just basic differences in signal to noise due to susceptibility artifacts between yeah. ROIs with that method. And, and now when you add a graph on top of this, a graph is a thresholding operation. So if you take a matrix that has different signal to noise in different subsets of that correlation matrix, right? Imagine a correlation matrix is actually composed of 16 submatrices, each of which has different signal to noise. And now I turn this into a graph. What yeah. in the hell is going to happen? All kinds of weird stuff's going to happen. Because right. the graph, the, the, this thresholding process is going to be affected by the noise, which you cannot remove. Yeah. And that's going to contaminate all of your further findings. Yeah. There are tons of MRI experiments where people compute functional connectivity under two different conditions. And they find that the graph structure changes. And my uh, constant refrain on these studies is, okay, the graph structure changed. Is that because the noise changed? Because if the noise changed, the graph's going to change. One of a really common finding in psychedelic drugs is when somebody is on LSD, say, their graph becomes more connected. Well, yep. did their graph really become more connected or just the brain just become more noisy everywhere? It became yeah. more noisy everywhere, then you're going to end up with more edges. You no, know, it's funny. I was just looking at I was just looking at someone's data the other day, and I, I said exactly that. It's like, oh, well, you see the connectivity changes. Is it because the noise changes? Or, yeah. is, it because, or is it because the, you know, the amplitude of one could change or this phase could change? Or, yeah. You know, that, that's why this is a fraught method. This should, I, I understand why people do functional connectivity. I understand under certain circumstances, it's the only thing you can do. Yeah. It should be avoided at all costs. Well, I mean, I think that, I think they, and so it sort of hits at exactly what people are trying to do when they struggle with fMRI in general is that you, 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 you have something that you, you know is a signal and, and, and you're not quite sure what is the noise or what is the signal? And you're you're just sort of it, people are iterating in in a sense of uh, trying to build these models based on iteration of uh, of you know you make a small assumption and then you and then you look at what results it produces. Then you can maybe use that to test. That's that's a really unprincipled, yeah, yeah. inefficient way to do science. Yeah, there are, this is a statistical problem. The way to solve this problem is use a statistical method that has been validated. There, you know, statistics goes back 200 years. We know a lot. Regression. We know how regression works really, really well. We know a lot about regression. Why would you pick some, you know, random method that where there has never been a paper published that actually tells you like what situations this will work under, what situations it won't work under, what its bias is of the estimator, what its variance is. None of that has never been published. Why would you ever use that method when you can just use regression? And there are a lot of those methods that people make. You know, usually some graduate student in the middle of their PhD thesis, like pulls something out of one of their orifices and, and uses it as a statistic and it, and it gets by their thesis advisor and it gets published in a journal and, a, and then it looks easy. And, you know, scientists being humans, they want a free lunch. Everybody wants a free lunch. So they start using it because it looks like a free lunch. But, you know, in science, whenever you see a free lunch, it's usually like the equivalent of Coke and Twinkies. It's not nourishing. You want a real lunch, you have to do some work. Uh, but but just to, just to try to I mean I I totally agree with I, I agree with everything you're saying. Uh, there's but it's just keep saying that Peter. We'll get I mean, along fine. <laughs> but I, but at the same time I have to temper you know some of the you know not to go quite that far because it certainly functional connectivity has shown results that are repeatable and, uh, and yeah yeah I'm not saying it's useless uh, right. but again I am a taxpayer. Why do something inefficiently when you can do it efficiently? Why, how, much, how much of the variance in naturalistic tasks does functional connectivity explain? Nobody knows. How well do the results generalize? Nobody knows. Nobody's ever done any of that. Yeah. The government is not paying you to do functional connectivity. They're paying you to build a model that predicts what the brain's going to do in the real world. That's the only thing they're paying you for. The government does not give a damn about your science. Well, I mean, I think that they also are paying for sort of trying to move. I mean, people are trying to use this, you know, I think it would be worthwhile to sort of have these comparisons with encoding models and things like that, because I think that people want, for instance, if you, if you see functional connectivity, uh, let's say, and it's a biomarker, let's say, let's say it shows up as something, I don't know if it will or not, but um, then 
it's a method that is shaky because you don't know exactly what the noise structure is, how it changes, but it kind of works. Again, that that's a low bar. I mean, right. you know, you you're in uh, you're in Washington D.C. If you wanted to go to San Francisco, you could take a mule. It'll work. W- would that be a smart thing to do in the modern age? No, that would be yeah. pretty dumb. <laughs> Why don't you just fly? Well, because because well, in, in functional connectivity, in resting state at least, when and I, I agree with you. I think that I'm to all for having more enriched uh, uh, time series with where you can build models, you can do other things, you can test hypotheses, and I, I'm all for. Even even doing tasks during during the uh, and looking at maybe connectivity as you're doing tasks or, or whatever. But I think that but I see what you're saying uh, that if if you want to, if you want to justify the stuff, well, I'm not even gonna I'm not even gonna say what it is. The stuff that is functional connectivity, and um, based on the fact that like collecting data in the clinic is hard, I think that's a separate conversation. I agree that that collecting data in the clinic is hard. I completely disagree that functional connectivity is going to solve that problem because even the functional connectivity aficionados, the people who are best at doing functional connectivity, who invented the field, like Randy Buckner and guys like that, who are smart guys, they would not collect functional connectivity for five minutes and assume that that was valid. They'd say you need to collect an hour's worth of functional connectivity data. Well, you know what? If you want to need to collect an hour's worth of data, it's already not clinically viable. Yeah. Because you only have 20 minutes. Yeah. So any any MRI method, any fMRI method that takes more than 20 minutes is not clinically viable. I totally. I, I agree. And that's actually right. There's this parameter space that, that we have to deal with that we don't know exactly. It goes back and forth. When you build encoding models, you're still making some predictions based on on some heuristics about, about what to expect from, from aspects of the stimulus. What? No. It's it's an explicit model. It's no a, heuri- a I mean, there might be a heuristic that drove that feature space, right. but it's 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 a completely explicit model. No, no, I agree uh, with that. Again, it's a total you're separating a- signal from noise. You know exactly what the noise is, what the signal is that you're predicting. You know yeah. what the noise is. Now, you don't have to fit an encoding model with an explicit feature space. You can fit, for example, in the clinic, you might decide, I just want to fit an encoding model with a neural network. I don't care why it works. A neural network is a universal approximator. A, a neural network does regression. But yeah. what it does is it does it locally uh, in a space that you don't actually understand. Yeah. And if all you want to do is prediction, then a neural network is fine. If you don't care about understanding, then, then just use a neural net. And it'll predict all the data it can predict. Uh, and it won't predict the noise yeah. based on how much data you have. So you could do that. But, but I mean, it will obviously predict better the better models you have uh, to right. feed into it. Uh, again, one of the reasons we use encoding models is that we have limited data sets. And the problem with fitting neural networks is they're very data greedy. They need a huge amount of data. And you really never get enough data from one human to be able to fit a decent neural network. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I mean, you can do it in a subspace and you can, and you can, you know, the usual trick people do is they train, they take a trained network that's been trained to do an analogous task. And then they use the hidden units in that network as features for an encoding model. And that's a perfectly valid thing to do. Uh, and oftentimes that will provide uh, insights indirectly because, it, you know, say, say um, to go back to the story task you were talking about earlier, Okay, you put people in the MRI machine, they listen to a bunch of stories. And now uh, you fit a model and, or a bunch of models. You might fit a phoneme model and a morpheme model and a syntax model and a semantics model and a narrative model. Yeah. The uh, semantics model will work really well because semantics unfolds at a time scale commensurate with MRI. The morphine and phoneme model will be horrible because that brain activity is happening at a time scale that's too fast for MRI. Yeah. But you, you can fit these models. Okay, fine. Now uh, there will be a bunch of variants that's not explained. Okay, well, what do I do? I, I don't know. I fit all the models I know about. I can't, I, I do not know what else to do. Well, fine. Now I take GPT-3, which is a standard open AI um, um, language model that actually works pretty damn well. Yeah. And uh, I use that as a source of features. In other words, I take the stimuli that I gave to the subjects. Yeah. I run it through GPT-3. GPT-3 produces activations. I take all of the hidden units and now they're sources of features. And now I fit those to the brain data. That's cool. And that is going to explain variants that I couldn't explain with any of my explicit models. Well, assuming that like, you know, the, uh, I mean, GPT-3 might use, uh, you know, some deep, it's a deep neural network right. process, assuming that the brain has some sort of analogous deep neural network uh, 
modules or, or well we'll get to that in a second uh, basically it, it's gonna it's probably gonna work if we if we read gpt3's output as a language model and it seems plausible then it's going to be correlated with the stuff the brain does right yeah. so it's going to produce activations that are correlated with what the brain does yes and it is likely and common that that network will actually it will predict activity in voxels that are poorly predicted by any of our explicit models because it's spanning a larger space of models Okay. Now, the problem, though, is, you know, again, you science works by you measure something, you build a model that explains those measurements, and then you predict. And yep. when you use a neural network model, you're jumping right over explanation. You're right. going from measurement to prediction without any explanation. So now you have fat, you've developed a model which predicts well, but you don't understand it. So now you have to go in and interrogate that model to try to extract its operating principles yes. to figure out why it's doing what it's doing. Yeah, that turns out to be hard, just like understanding the brain is hard, because yeah. that turns out to be, you know, just an inference problem of, <laughs> yeah. of interpreting a complicated network, which is what we do in neuroscience anyway. But but it is another alternative by playing that by playing games, those two games simultaneously, where yeah. you fit all the explicit encoding models you can and you fit neural networks. What you do is you uh, are, you slowly essentially increase the number of encoding models and uh, that that are contributing to your explanation yeah. and you account for more and more of the data. Okay. So, so for example, in the navigation network, the navigation network um, project, we have 30 different feature spaces that we're fitting, 30 different encoding models. So yeah. we have one uh, experiment. You can think of that as testing 30 different hypotheses. Yeah. Plus uh, a neural network. So, right. That's really cool. I like, I like that idea uh, of, of putting it into a neural network to try to pull out the features or, or, or have more features. I mean, yeah, you just have to remember that you're not done, right? The, right. Oftentimes, what happens is people like find that a neural network predicts and then they declare victory. No, no, that's not victory. That's victory if you're, if you're Tesla trying to build a self driving car because they don't care why it works. Yeah. But we are scientists, we care why it works. So, getting a neural network to predict your data is necessary, but not sufficient for science. You have to explain to me why it works. Okay, so you don't think that what another way, I mean, not necessary for testing hypothesis, but for generating features might be um, just looking at, you know, for instance, cross-subject correlation. And let's say you could also use the models. Let's say you use some encoding regressors. And so where the subjects show high correlation where the regressors don't predict, you then can go back to the stimulus uh, or you know, itself and see, oh, so- yeah, that's and, th and then you would build an encoding model and go forward again. Right. That is, uh, there's nothing wrong in principle with that. It just won't be all that useful in practice okay. uh, for multiple reasons. First of all, cross-subject correlation, again, does not separate. It, it does separate signal from noise, but it does it too well. Um, in other words, it's, it, it, you're only going to find the part of the signal that is correlated with other subject signals, not right. the part of the signal that is unique to you. Yeah, yeah. And in all, in every complicated MRI task we've ever done in my lab, we find a pretty consistent result, which is about a third of the variance in the MRI data is uh, the group model, and about two thirds is individual subjects. Well, you could also imagine designing an experiment where you have the same stimulus over and over for the same subject, and then see what correlates with themselves. You you could you could so that and 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 you know that's if you like to have a hard life and like go to San Francisco on a mule, you can do that. Um, <laughs> The, because the other the other part of what you said is oh well that'll probably pull out stuff you don't see in an encoding model and the answer to that is I've never seen that happen okay I've never seen anything in a group in a, in a cross subject correlation paper uh, reported as a result that wasn't something you would have intuitively come up with if you just did an encoding model yeah and if and if you and if you remember one of those results I would be interested to know about it yes yeah, like I can't even think of one. I, I, we haven't worked with that as much as uh, yet but but yeah we are struggling with this issue and, and so this is uh, I mean at least for my own group but probably a lot of groups are trying to think about this sort of way of, of, of designing paradigms and the, the, basically the cross cross subject correlations are what you is, are a method you use if you don't know how to fit encoding models yep I, functional exactly. connectivity is a method you use if you don't have any x variables right these are both degenerate cases yes. of science they're not they're not optimal solutions the optimal solution again it's regression it turns out it's regression that's what you want to do yeah I, <laughs> and i i agree with you i agree i agree that um there's a hierarchy of of of, of what you can Methods. say depending yeah, on yeah. so yeah yeah i realize we're we're uh, we're running <laughs> 
we got to question one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I told you there would be more than one hour worth of yeah, stuff going yeah. on in this talk. Well, I think we're running short of time now. And just for the sake of, you know, keeping the, you know, everything and respecting your time and, and keeping the podcast uh, uh, short. However, you know, this, all these points are great. And I think that uh, there's so much more to talk to you about. It, it would be great to have you back uh, at some other point. In time. Well, I'm a professor. I can talk for 24 hours straight, like a professor. <laughs> so if you want to talk again sometime about another related topic, I'd be happy to do that, Peter. I always enjoy talking to you. Yeah, I'd love it. I'd love it. That'd be great. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and yeah, this has been really fun. This has been, I mean, it's, this is sort of like the type of problem you want to have where you have, uh, uh so many interesting points to bring out and interesting topics. And, and yeah, we haven't even touched on, you know, things like layer FRI, things like, you know, going into clinical application, you know, future or stuff like that. And also uh, some of your papers too, where, where they're just really maybe worthwhile to bring out points with those, but for another podcast, uh, hopefully, uh, maybe, maybe soon, who knows? Um, okay. Well, it was, it was good talking to you. Good talking to you. And, uh, and thanks. Thanks for coming on. Neurosalience is brought to you by the Organization for Human Brain Mapping and is produced by Anastasia Brovkin, Ekaterina Dobrikova, Katie Moran, Niels Mulert, Kevin Zetek, and me, Rachel Stickland. 